Hello and welcome to the Quarantine Break Podcast. Today's conversation is a really good one, so I'm just going to get straight into it. I spoke to screenwriter Sarah Phelps, the writer behind some of the biggest TV shows of recent times, Dublin Murders, The Casual Vacancy, and Then There Were None, and most recently, The Pale Horse. Sarah was a wonderful guest, and I can't wait for you to hear this. Take a listen, and I'll be back at the end. Hello, Sarah. A very warm welcome to you. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. The question I have to ask everyone first, and it becomes more loaded as the lockdown continues, but are you well? Are you feeling healthy? I'm in physically, I'm feeling quite well and healthy. The brain shatters every now and again. Mm. I had a really, really bad spate where I got extremely terrified and lay on the floor quite a lot. Um, and um, I think then I gave myself a good hard talking to and just thought, yeah, just had to do small things that just small things rather than look at huge things because yeah. the huge things are too terrifying. Um, and obviously, Clearly, because you can see me, one of the first things I did was take a set of nail scissors and my and dog clippers to my hair for <laughs> reasons best known to myself. Um, I don't know. I, I find a lot of people are doing that. Like yeah. it's a sort of maybe it's an expression of that kind of anxiety, which is um, the the change. You have to make a radical change to somehow mirror the terrifying change that's going on and if you shave your head basically what you feel is chilly and extremely (laughs) vulnerable and you're suddenly aware that cupboards you don't close cupboards enough and you should do because when you stand up you brain yourself but yeah I'm quite I'm quite kind of liking my I think it looks great I think if I did it I would sort of just look like a dodgy potato well, I, I won't lie. When I first did it, I kept thinking I, I'm going to have to put on a full face of makeup when I go out because I do look like I lurk around to eat twitching roadkill. That's what I look like. <laughs> but I've sort of grown into it. I've got used to it. But yeah, apart from that, apart from that, mad, mad moments of you know, let's go out and plant some stuff and let's 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 try and cook some bread. Let's yeah. try and cook some biscuits and Jesus fucking Christ, what is happening? What is happening? I'm terrified about what's happening in America. I yeah. don't, there are too many people with too many guns and mm. I feel very, very frightened for people who live in America, friends who live there. Very frightened. The Trump press conference the other day was mad, wasn't it? He's been mad all this time and now it's just even more mad. but everybody seems to be mad like apparently there's some dr phil who's on i mean uh, you know and he's saying like well, well you know we we don't close the country down when there are swimming pool deaths or people die from smoking cigarettes like yeah what the fuck is wrong with you people are you literally you is your spinal cord not touch your brain are you breathing through gills what's happening <laughs> but uh, yeah so uh, but i uh, the other thing was ration the news Morning, early evening, just try and avoid because otherwise you will go crazy. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, the idea of this podcast is to take a bit of a tea break from the news and especially those WhatsApp groups where somebody's friends, brothers, sister... Yeah, mute, mute, mute. Oh, yeah, people sort of like, you know, 5G conspiracy theories and and the fact that somebody from down the road has been out longer than their allotted allotted hour and people are breaking. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, calm your shit down. So this sounds like a very good idea, yeah. A friend of mine uh, discovered their neighbour was a 5G uh, conspiracy conspiracy theorist. I I think I just have to move. Well, move or just shower sort of contempt and disbelief it's just like here's a pig put it on trial it's exactly what it is it's witch burning um there's a really brilliant uh guy called dean burnett who's a neuroscientist and does little kind of youtube lectures on neuroscience and the development of the brain and why the brain does what the brain does and he did a really interesting thing about um why the human brain seeks out conspiracy theories, seeks it out and clings to it for comfort. And um, it's really worth checking out. Um, he has a book called The Happy Brain as well. He's really smart. And, we, and and 
science is very comforting, I find. Oh, yes, definitely. But he's, yeah, he's, he's really good on why, on, on why we need conspiracy theories, why we find so much comfort and cleave to them so much. It's like a kind of camouflage and we, we, we desire patterns and conspiracy theories are proof of patterns and we really desire patterns as partly for survival and partly for community and social cohesion. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he's fascinating. I'll put the link in the bio because, yeah, science is something good to cling on to at the moment. Yeah, so, I, but it is, it's an interesting thing if it, um, you know, a thousand years ago, whatever, not even a thousand years ago, not even that far, far back, you know, you, pigs would be put on trial. And I've just finished reading The Mirror and the Light where they're burning people for all sorts of, you know, reasons of what their faith is or what they believe or what they read or how they you know what what language they write the word of god in and you just think yeah you know we're never that really far away from these people at all at all it all just lurks there under our skin just (laughs) just waiting you know any more than all those right-wing loons parading with their massive assault rifles what do they think they're gonna do shoot the virus i mean (laughs) anyway (laughs) I noticed you had a, uh, a tea there. Um, what kind of tea are you having? What kind of blend? I'm actually having a cup of coffee, and I'm a very, very lazy coffee maker. Like I have lots of nice coffee and and those really nice little, um, like my favourite one is a Vesuvio, those little pots that you put on the, on the stove and then they bubble oh, up. Lovely. I just love the kind of like the basic alchemy of it where it, yeah, there's nothing in the little top pot and then it's full of coffee and it's all spitting and bubbling. It's really exciting. But I'm extremely lazy. So that, I'm afraid, is a cup of instant coffee. And for my tea, Yorkshire Gold. Oh, lovely. Yorkshire Gold or we will fight. (laughs) I had uh, Rufus Jones on the podcast last week. And I don't know if you knew this before you worked with him on the casual vacancy, but he doesn't like tea. The fuck? (laughs) Oh, Oh, he kept that under his hat. He kept that quiet. I don't know why you hired him. I don't even trust him. Rufus, I don't, I can't look at you. He doesn't, he's not a tea drinker. No. And some of the characters he's played, like very, very sort of straight laced Englishmen. I know. He's just revealed this deep vein of depravity. Yeah. <laughs> deep, deep vein of depravity. That's one of my favourite TV moments, I've got to say, is Rufus Jones, stark, stark naked. Oh, it was wonderful, wasn't it? Uh, well, in, an off- in, a, in a glass office, wielding a yucca plant, <laughs> screaming about Brexit. I thought it was one of the my highlights. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, yeah, so I'm a coffee... Tea. I can't stand Earl Grey. I don't understand Earl Grey. Why is it? Who drinks it and why? Nice. I like a nice orange brew, a oh. good orange brew. So you can trot a mouse on it, as my granny used to say. <laughs> That's a lovely expression. I know. It's got to be, you know, stewed. That's how she liked her tea, stewed. I always mention this at this point in the show but we are on video chat today as we of course are social distancing although as a friend pointed out the other day whenever i say video chat i sound like i'm 107 yeah yeah <laughs> what is it then video conferencing house party what do you call it i don't know i just sound very old when i say video chat apparently i sound I... very old all the time i've got no <laughs> idea what anybody is talking about most of the time and um one of my uh my mum's neighbors over the road they're they're daughter is a, a drummer and i was like oh look at that you know slapping that was well, stone cold badass queen slapping those skins <laughs> i just thought if you'd ever tried to sound more of a sad pathetic <laughs> middle-aged old bitch you just did it you just did it and it, I, I i i felt covered in shame <laughs> But have you been using video calling apps uh, to kind of like keep connected with people? <laughs> yeah. So basically uh, now, so we, um, this this is an advent of the new thing. Like uh, before I was never really into FaceTime because I mean, like uh, I, I was just like, no, why God, it's bad enough. You know, I don't want to see people or have people see <laughs> yeah. me or see what I'm doing, but now I'm, I'm loving it. Just seeing people's faces. And we've got the, um, we have work, um, I was doing some work as this pandemic and came and everybody went into lockdown. I was um, I, I was in a position where contractually I had to deliver some scripts. While this was going on, I was like, 
Christ almighty. I, and I, you know, my brain felt like broken glass. It's like, how the hell am I going to do this? But um, myself and my script, ed- my script editor is Canadian and had gone back to Canada to self-isolate in her parents' basement. So her, from her parents' basement, me here and my fellow execs in Essex and in another part of the country, basically having script meetings on on sort of Zoom. and or And it was just like... <laughs> This is this how quickly we become attuned to this new version of normal. And I yeah. hate meetings at the best of time. I absolutely hate them. And there's always a point where I think it took me so long to give up smoking was because a cigarette was a really good reason to leave a meeting. So I could just get up and go outside for 20 minutes and, and come yes. back. And, and um, yeah. so I, I hate sitting in rooms with people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I quite... I think this is, you know, it's it's astonishing how swiftly we adapt to something so that we can, some, you know, those of us who are lucky enough to still have some sort of work can carry on doing it. And I'm reading through Twitter and, like, there are people I really revere and love and admire and they're just like, what, what the hell happens now? Yeah. And it just makes me very frightened for them. But... Yeah, there's been a lot of video conferencing and a lot of um, family WhatsApp and family Zoom and things like that, where me and my brothers just end up sort of like flicking V signs at each other, like total children and not middle-aged old farts. <laughs> uh, you just mentioned you've just finished some scripts. So creatively, are you finding this a challenging time? Like, I, um, I'm really struggling to kind of get my brain into any kind of gear at the moment. I think the difficulty is, was... Um, the scripts I was writing were actually about the world, about the um, 2008 financial crash. Mm. And I think what helped was the idea that suddenly, almost overnight, the world as you know it is no more. Yeah. No more. Everything is snapped. Everything is gone. The horizons are completely tilted and the roof has fallen in. And so even though I was like, I, I can't even, you know, some, sometimes, you know yourself, you know, you think, I don't even understand what sentences are. What are words? Why are words? What are these people doing? How are they touching each other? Why are they, why are they in the same room? Why aren't they wearing glass? Um, at the same time, there's something about the fact that everybody is in a state of trauma, grief, fear, betrayal that they're flooded with cortisol and that kind of made sense for what I was writing and I've got to get on and write another I'm getting on to write another project and cranking my brain up to it at the moment and again you think what on earth has this got to do with anything that we're going through now and in order to kind of like find some fellow feeling you thought I, I was just reasoning to myself what well, every single one of these characters is flooded with cortisol every single one of them is and every single one of them is desperately trying to hang on to the world as they knew it yeah and it's just not going to happen so even though i'm not writing about a pandemic or about the terror that comes when you're everything you're used to everything you take for granted and we do take for granted i mean i'm sure our reaction is part it is a sign of our overwhelming privilege i mean if mm. you if you suffered from you know ebola outbreaks or sars or anything like that you you kind of go here it comes again yeah yeah and we've been so you know luxuriating in our sort of like uh I don't know, our entitlement, I suppose, that the shock is even greater. Oh, shit, look, it's happening to us. Um, but all the same time that you just take those feelings and plunge them into your characters that you're writing now, even if they're 200 years ago or 100 years ago. I read that I read that you were once stuck on an EastEnders script and you just added more filth, which is also another way to go. Oh, yeah, I made it into a porn. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, sometimes you were just kind of... Oh, you're sort of sitting you go, I don't know how to start this or or how to generate the kind of roller coaster of this really matters, this is really important for and I just ended up sort of like the door gets kicked in and Phil comes in and <laughs> bends somebody over the sink and there's Nicholas Fine. No, don't Phil, what you're doing? Shut it, just take it, just take it. <laughs> and and then you kind of get three pages in where, you know, there's just 
cum dripping off the ceiling. You don't know, well, I'll delete that now and I'll go back and this is something to do with the, the arches. I, I don't know, but I've, you have to get you have to get these things off your chest. <laughs> at least you're writing, at least you're putting words down on a page. A lot of people are working from home for the first time and conceivably for the foreseeable. Do you have any tips? I remember Rufus Jones saying that when he asked you about writing, for example, you were just like, I'll fucking write it. There, there is that you that at some point you you have to just sit down and go and do it you have to just sit down and do it and the you know I mean it's lovely to and I love I'm very self-indulgent I've got flow to and go oh, I can't I just don't I just stop feeling it today and you no it, it's not about feeling it it's about sitting down and hammering and sometimes I don't know just dragging it out and if you look back at the work you've done over a day and like one one sentence or one phrase doesn't want to make you kind of break a bottle and jab the ends into your neck then you're doing great yeah. and in fact you're doing great anyway but there comes a point where you just you sit there and you hammer it out and if anything just sort of thinking that these all of the feelings that you're feeling that you're feeling now like absolute terror anxiety strange moments of overwhelming euphoria inertia exhaustion anxiety grief that you you put it you even if you're not writing about a pandemic you put all those feelings into what you're writing about how startling they are and how quickly they move from one to the yeah. other from overwhelming anxiety to a really peculiar jubilation at something really odd and strange like there was a deer <laughs> i live in the country and i was sort of was awake quite early in the morning because i generally am awake very early in the morning because i sleep like a sack of shit and i looked out the window and there's a, uh, um, a, a small deer just walking down the road <laughs> you know and, and we do get deer on the road quite a lot but i and normally if i saw that i'd think oh god there'll be something to pick up there'll be it'll be dead it won't make it somebody will hit it and just thought now you're fine <laughs> you're fine you 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 saunter you meander and there's strange little things like that which just give you these bolts of unalloyed happiness and then the anxiety again but you just have to you have to put it into what you're working on however you can are you watching devs oh yeah i am yeah it's fucking it's so beautiful it's, it's sort of wonderful not yeah and terrifying yeah. and that soundtrack I mean you can't really call it a soundtrack it's like it's another character the way a really good soundtrack should be but it's like having a really really highly stropped razor just lightly scraping at your <laughs> synapses it, it, oh, it's, it's so good I yeah. just think I just think it's so beautiful it's so kind of like lush and austere and I oh I think it's wonderful yeah I've actually put a note here to talk about uh devs because I saw that you tweeted about it and I watched it last night uh for the first time I've only seen the first episode but yeah oh, fucking oh, 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 fucking oh, oh. hell so good I watched it's it's one of those things I'm like because I'm quite I'm I have I I can't make my brain understand things like science yeah I can't be, and any time i have to think of math <laughs> and even if i even if i have to write down a phone number um i have to put a post-it note over it so i can only see two numbers at the same time otherwise they start multiplying and flipping themselves upside down <laughs> so so looking at a tv screen filled with the kind of cascade of code you can imagine yeah. it's like having a fucking anxiety attack as far as <laughs> i'm concerned just like this is my normal life when i'm trying to take down a phone number but it's um i just think it's it's i think it's just astonishing there is a bit there is a bit in um episode two where i i made an involuntary noise oh amazing and the involuntary noise was oh <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I've just sort of like um, uh, through Adam Rutherford who helped out with the research um, and works for, has worked with Alex Garland before I mm. believe but um, I think in Ex Machina and things like that um, and I've sort of found that you know, all the people who work on the FX and work on the soundtrack just saying to them this is this is this is 
You know, um, I'm much, much older than you, so I can remember the first time I saw um, Singer Detective and go, oh, TV can do this. Not just Singer Detective, but there was a there was a version of Baal, the, uh, mm. uh, the Brecht play, in which David Bowie was Baal. Yeah. And I, I, it's one of those things where you go, oh, I see. Sing Detective and Baal, television can do this. Television can do this. And when I'm watching Devs, I think the same thing. Oh, I see. Television can do this. How absolutely astonishing and exciting and rich and numinous and utterly, utterly terrifying. Yeah, oh, my, my, my head, head exploded in that first episode. I, I, <sighs> I sort of want to save it, though, because it looks so... It's interesting you should say that because one of the... Um, people uh, who worked on the FX said, you know what, don't binge it, mm. let it roll around. Yeah, yeah. Because it's one of those things where you need to, like there's so many shows you can binge, you just go bang, 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 and it does end up washing over you. And I'm doing the same with Better Call Saul, which is I'm just going to write just two episodes max, I'm not going to do the thing where I just race through because you just don't take it on. But I think this guy is right, because once you're so kind of drunk in a good way like you need to kind of like readjust back into the uh the normal physical world yeah so i think he's right i think i'm going to really be sparse with it and i like that um nick offman is a little bit ron swanson ish in it it's like a combination of being somebody in profound state of depression somebody entirely consumed with grief and completely and utterly psychopathic oh, at yeah. the same time <laughs> I've been watching so much TV in the past week. Uh, we sp- we've spoken about devs. Uh, what else have yeah. you been watching? I watched um, the first episode of Run, which I really enjoyed oh, it was very really much. Good, wasn't it? I am completely obsessed with the repair shop on BBC on the BBC, oh, it's which amazing, is amazing, isn't it? I just love it. Um, uh, Julia Rayside says, oh, it's a barn full of sexy bag pusses. And I just think, <laughs> it is a barn full of sexy bag pusses. I absolutely love it. I I, I love seeing people who are really brilliant at doing things like that. Yeah. And the care and the attention and the skill and the expertise, expertise. It, It's like, it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and I've been... I rewatched all of Wolf Hall just because, you know, and um, obsessed with cooking shows, makeover shows, <laughs> anything that's vague, <laughs> anything that it's really weird because it's anything that's vaguely comforting, like a nice cooking show compared to Wolf Hall, which is the most uncomforting thing completely. Mm. And um, there's a lovely film on called Their Finest, which is a yeah. total joy, and it's about people making propaganda films during World War Two. It is absolutely lovely. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a lovely film. Oh, I absolutely love it. It's it's yeah. gorgeous. It's gorgeous. But I, I'm going to have to fight shy of anything that's too obviously scary because I don't know if I've got the emotional capacity to withstand it at the moment. Well, yeah. Don't, don't mind, right? I mean, like, obviously, Devs is... But... Um, <laughs> But anything, I, I can't do horror. Can you do horror? No, I mean, I once saw the trailer for the Babadook and I cried. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a horror person. I mean, I can't. I mean, so many people have been sort of tweeting about these, you know, beautiful documentaries they've been watching recently, and I've been quite feeling quite guilty because I've just been dipping back into Friends. I think that's fine. I think that's. I, yeah. Oh, I tell you what else is good is Unorthodox on Netflix. Yes. It's uh, and the actress in that, Shira Haas, is a. Mm. Astonishing. She's absolutely astonishing. It's brilliant. Um, I'm, yeah, just comforting things. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. But um, I'm rubbish with horror. And uh, even to this day, I have to watch something like Don't Look Now or The Shining through a buttonhole so that yeah. I can close it if it gets too much. And, um, you know, even the, the, do you remember that, you know, Alton Towers, they've got a, a saw ride. Yes, yeah. I can't watch the advert for it. It makes me too anxious. <laughs> and it just makes me feel like I'm going to wean myself or something. It's just too much. I can't bear it.
we were at a time when people were saying, oh, there's too much, there's too much great TV at the moment. And now so many TV shows have been put on hiatus. But I think the yeah. thing that really sort of brought it home for me was when things like EastEnders or Corrie stopped filming. It was like when they yeah. switched off Big Ben, but people outside the, the Houses of Parliament gave a fuck. Yeah, it's, I, I don't know, I think people will will give a fuck. It is, yeah. it's not quite Ravens leaving the tower, but, you know, especially with Corrie, which has been going for so long, but EastEnders, which of course is my beloved, my beloved warp child. Yeah. It, um, and it is, you do think, well, obviously all the writers will still be writing and getting ahead and planning ahead and planning ahead. But it is difficult to think when are those shows going to be able to be stood up again? Yeah. And, you know, from my point of view, when you're thinking about, well, how does how will production work in the future? Like, obviously, shows that have got, say, two episodes left to shoot will have to try and get those in. But shows that were in, like, soft prep and that are maybe shooting with multiple locations over the world... I can't, you can't see that happening, yeah. can you? No, no, not at all. And also, imagine trying to crew up when, say, if it's, if you get a, a vaccine and everything's lifted and we go back to life as before, the idea of trying to crew up when there's this huge bottleneck and great big streaming giants like Netflix will be just like hoovering it all up. Well, um, yeah. is It's going to be, it's, it's, going to be really 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 tricky i wonder how all the smaller streaming platforms will cope i want but what what really comes across so much is the value of film and tv and theater and music and dance and create the creative industries yeah. it everybody is streaming you've got some fantastic things you know like wise children is on iplayer you've got the RSC um, streaming shows, you've got the National Theatre streaming shows, you think, thank God, thank God. Yeah. And uh, but and in the future, I think the attention be like, these are so important as industries, stop belittling them, yes. stop belittling the skills that go into them, in the same way that we now know who the key workers are, and they're the people who are paid least in our society. Yeah. We don't have them, we don't have shit. One of the suggestions uh, for EastEnders, if we do run out of episodes, is to rerun classic ones. Uh, do you have any favourite episodes of yours that they you hope they show again? Oh, God, I don't know. Peggy Mitchell's death is obviously a huge fan favourite. Oh, Peggy Mitchell. Well, yeah, bringing back Pat as a ghost. I love doing that. Because, of course, who would you want? Who would you want at the end? You wouldn't want any of your lovers or your husbands or even your kids. You want the face you'd slap a thousand times. <laughs> you'd want Pat all lit up like a Woolworths Christmas tree. That's who you'd want to see you across the river. I, and they're such, they're such a pair of dames, those two. I love them so much. It was the sheer pleasure of thinking, we're going to do this. Yeah. I'm going to do this. I'm going to... that Because you know that there's... A, there's um, that when you've got like a tumour in your brain or some kind of brain disturbance or injury, you can smell burning. Mm. And the idea that every time Peggy thought, oh, God, I'm losing it, I'm losing it, I keep smelling burning, I keep smelling burning, that actually every single time that happened, it was Pat with her cigarette just there. <laughs> just as, and instead of being terrifying, it was comfort. Oh, it's, that's lovely. And you wrote uh, quite a lot of the Den stuff as well. Oh, yeah, I had loads of bloody Den. You know, brought him back from the dead, killed him with Pauline Fowler's <laughs> dog-shaped doorstop, which might be a fun one to watch, and then <laughs> dug him up. Then And then Sam Mitchell went mad on vodka and dug him up during Sharon and Dennis's <laughs> wedding um, to the sound of the Ride of the Valkyries, which in a strange subplot, I had Ian Wynn, uh, as a CD of hooked hooked on opera in a in a box of uh, cereal, and he just sort of annoyed the square by kept play <laughs> he kept playing it. So those sorts of things, and the other ones which I was really proud of, like I was really really proud of Stacy Slater going home to look after her mum, and you realise that this bullshit stroppy little girl that she's a child she's she's been a child carer all her life yeah. and she's lived more life than you could ever possibly imagine the killing of Paul Truman I absolutely love because Gary Beale is, is a phenomenal actor and the pleasure of writing for an actor of that calibre as well is just fantastic but who knows I've written a lot <laughs> <laughs> I did a lot do you, do you miss EastEnders writing for mm. it? yeah, some, yeah I, really, I think you always do it's always it's always there in you know in you know little 
a piece of my heart will always be Walford, always be E20. I absolutely yeah. loved, I, I loved my time there. And um, I loved popping back for a visit and I loved, I loved all the, the depth to those characters and the way to think about them. You know, I always thought that they're, they're the Furies from ancient Greek tragedy, but they've got <laughs> acrylic nails and extensions. And <laughs> they're Margaret d'Anjou and Eleanor of Aquitaine wading thigh high <laughs> through the blood of their enemies, carrying a Primark bag. Oh, it's, you know, that's, it's that great big, those huge mythic things, those huge mythic themes played out in this tiny little plot of land. And I mean, there's nothing, and I, I love it because there's, you take a, a peroxided East Enders matriarch, and you plonk her down in front of her worst enemy, and all that's there on the table is a bottle of gin and a packet of cigarettes, <laughs> and you've got half an hour. I just absolutely love it. I love it still, oh, so and I good. hope it's. A, I I hope to see it back soon. <sighs> oh, can I make another TV recommendation? Oh yeah. Okay, so on iPlayer, there is a half-hour pilot for a comedy called Alma's Not Normal. Oh, And yes. it is half an hour of joy. It is wonderful. It's got the most fantastic cast. The jokes are laugh out loud. It's heartbreaking. It's human. It's warm. It's hilarious. It's dirty. It's filthy. <laughs> it's funny. It's lovely. It's really, really, really smashing and now i want like three series of it yeah it's but on it's my to watch list it's, it's really great it's really fantastic the cast i think is also really good oh it's it's amazing lorraine ashbourne siobhan finner and it's really great it's really just you know like when you're having your lunch or you're having your coffee break alma's not normal on iplayer it's fantastic What about books? Are you reading books at the moment? Have you got the headspace to uh, to read books at the moment? Yeah, but I, li I listen to a lot of audio books because uh, then I can do stuff around the house, take the dogs for a walk. And when I'm working, the sort of the time that I've got for reading is time that also has to be walking the dogs or going to the supermarket or doing whatever. So I'm always plugged into an audio book. And I've been um, The Mirror and the Light, the final instalment of the Hilary, Man Hilary Mantel trilogy. And I, when I got to the end, I was absolutely floored. I yeah. floored. I was bereft and devastated. I thought, I'm in tears. I am heartbroken for a man who was executed 500 years ago. <laughs> It's so good. It's so good. And um, and what I'm reading now is I... Well, I'm listening to... Um, I've just finished Kate Atkinson's Life After Life. Mm. Again, re-listening re re to that. And I do a lot of that, like revisiting. I've been reading plays that I wanted to go and see and aren't, I'm not going to be able to see now. So I just finished reading um, The Welkin by Lucy Kirkwood, which is completely brilliant and i mentioned that on twitter and jonathan harvey pointed me towards a series on channel four that's going to be coming up that lucy kirkwood has written it's called adult behavior um and i watched the trailer for it oh my god it looks absolutely fantastic yes, it's got yeah. Hayley squires in it and it's got rupert everett in one of the most <laughs> astonishing wigs and it looks brilliant and he's worn so, many over the years Oh, it, I cannot, I literally cannot wait for this. It looks amazing. So if you've got a bit of time and you're fooling around, just go onto the Channel 4 website and adult behaviour trailer and just go, I cannot wait to see this. It just looks fantastic. Lucy Kirkwood is a brilliant, brilliant writer. So, um, so yeah, I'm reading a lot of plays and poetry and listening to a lot of novels and watching a lot of TV and putting up a lot of fairy lights and every now and again I read some of my own research for the next project I've got to do and go, really, what are you what are you talking about? <laughs> and then at and because to write I like to fill up and then I yeah. kind of every fill up with everything and then I just splurge it out. So at some point I'll sit down and it will all splurge. 
I'll, I'll beat it out somehow. <laughs> Is there anything else that you're doing to kind of take your mind off? Are you a meditation app person? Oh, fuck no. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I'm, I'm not very good at those sorts of things. Yeah. And I always find that when somebody starts talking to me in a calming voice, I either go to sleep or I want to punch them. <laughs> I find that I'm... I'm genuinely quite tightly wound as a human being anyway. And uh, when people sort of, now, remember you are worth breathing for. So deep breath. And you're like, you fucking patronise me, you bastard. And so that's, that, really isn't my, that really isn't my thing at all. And I generally tend to, well, I'll go for a long walk with the dogs and I always find like drinking heavily is quite good. <laughs> I'm I'm a huge fan of wine. Well, happy hour can be any any hour now. I think a friend of mine just sent me a bottle of uh, violet and honey gin, which is a really alarming kind of purple colour, and it's absolutely delicious. So you sort of get your you know you sort of look at your clock and think. Is the sun over the yard on on a Friday? Not really, but meditation apps no, they're not for me. They're not for me at all. Anytime I see one of these social media challenges at the moment, like that, that's enough to make me want to drink. Yeah, no, social media challenges to do what? No, what, learn another language? No, leave me alone. Do something? No, leave me alone. I want to lie on the sofa right now. Tomorrow I might get up and do something else. But other than that, I... I, I... I really like I really hate Christmas and New Year because I hate being told when to have fun. Yeah. Boxing Day, bang on. <laughs> January the third, bring it to me. I love it. But you know, people go, Yay, it's New Year. So fucking what? <laughs> Yay, it's Christmas Day. Yeah, Jesus Christ. It's just a big roast dinner and everyone drinking tea and flushing the toilet too much. It's it's I'm, I'm such a miserable bastard. <laughs> but yeah, no social media challenges. Not for me, um, anything like that. Meditation, yeah, it works for a lot of people. Doesn't work for me. It just makes me angry. <laughs> just makes me. Just makes me furious. Just makes me violent. Um, I had been wanting to chat about how an Agatha Christie style murder mystery in the world of self isolation and quarantine would work, but I sort of think isolation seems like a big theme in her work anyway. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, I mean, and then there were none. You've never. <laughs> that is a that that is a pure lockdown situation. I mean, it's. I mean, like in. I suppose. Yeah, I suppose we're in a locked room murder mist. Well, you know, hopefully not too much murder. Let's not make light of that. But and anyway, you always get those things of isolation because people are so riven with guilt and shame for the thing that they've done that they hope no one's ever going to find out about. I wonder how you do it. You could, I suppose, a Zoom murder mystery. I don't oh, know yeah. how that would work. I'm not sure that I want to think about murder too much <laughs> during the during this time. <clears throat> that feels like a safe thing to think. It feels um. It feels like that might just send me off the deep end. Um, although I read, like most people, and certainly myself, uh, you grew up uh, reading Ian Fleming as opposed to Agatha Christie. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that you always, when you're sort of transitioning from children's books and you're really aware that there are grown-up books with grown-up themes and you kind of grab onto whatever's on the bookshelf set. And uh, there was... Um, there was never any Agatha Christie at home. I don't know why. There was a lot of Nao Marsh, and um, and at my grandparents' house where I used to go and stay, they had every single Ian Fleming in a long line. And I, it's not the sort of thing I should have been reading as a sort of nine-year-old, ten-year-old, but I absolutely devoured them. And I do honestly think <laughs> it's played quite a large part in how my kind of how I've kind of developed as a human being. Because they they are. When you look back on them, it's uh, interesting what you kind of accept as a child and go, that seems perfectly normal. Yeah. That seems like a perfectly normal way <laughs> to talk to somebody. And then when you look back, you go, that's really, that is high level sadomasochism. Yeah. Should I really have been reading that? <laughs> well, probably not at all, but there we are. You grab onto, um, you grab onto it. And so I had never, ever, until I read, and then there were none, I'd never read any Agatha Christie. So I was so, because I really, really thought that it would be um, sort of 
I don't know, just a little bit safe, just a little bit English villages. Yeah. And, and you, I mean, like, and I'd never watched an adaptation all the way through. Of course, you're aware of who plays them and the fact that, that the big cinematic things, like, you know, Peter Euston of like, Death and the Nile and things like that mm. were a huge cinematic treat and they were waspish and bitchy and glamorous, but I never saw them. I never, ever saw them. And... um when Damien Timmer from Mammoth said, read, and then there were none, I was really so genuinely shocked by what it was. Oh, yeah, it really, it really, it really took my breath away because you kind of think, oh, it's going to be a little old lady and or, or more to the point, here's a beautiful country house and someone's lying on the rug and there's got a poker in their eye and nobody really cares and later on they'll all be called around and they'll stand there while they're lit, where their crimes are read out and nobody tries to run away for, you know, and it it's not that at all. They're really, really it's quite astonishingly, um, I was quite astonished by the brutality of it. Mm. So I think that was... That was really good for doing those adaptations because I could be shocked rather than familiar. Yeah. Everything was unfamiliar. So I could go, what's that doing there? Rather than going, being so um, hampered, I suppose, by the familiarity or by the, I think people, I think you get really involved with who you were when you read a book yeah, and what it meant to you. So, say, for example, if I had read it, you know, perhaps when I was, um, you know, staying somewhere, you could imagine there would be some a, a sort of like a slightly illicit thrill. But you know, you'd you'd sm- smell the smell of the house or the smell of baking, or if it was raining outside, or whether you were getting over mumps or a cold, and and you become very involved with the memory of of who you were and where you were when you first read, and that can be quite romantic. That kind of nostalgia, and it can blind you to what's to what the book is yeah so not having had that familiarity and only having unfamiliarity and shock i think that kind of stood me in good stood me in good stead yeah and i mean speaking of shock like so many people were shocked about the ending of the pale horse like i was looking i was looking at it recently and uh, i think eight eight and a half million searches in google about the pale horse ending uh have you enjoyed people's theories uh, about that ending yeah, of course I have. I, I mean, it's <clears throat> this is quite interesting. Okay, so I belong to a local, uh, I belong to a local volunteer organisation for you know getting groceries and medications for people who who are vulnerable. And I went and did some shopping for uh, a lady in who's a neighbour, and I was dropping her shopping off at the drive, and um, her neighbours were out raking their lawn, mm. and uh, the bloke came over. I don't know, sort of late 50s, and he went, you're the author. And I went, well, strictly speaking, I'm not, but, um, I'm, yeah, I'm a screenwriter. And he went, like, you're the one that does the Christie's. And he was sort of pointing his finger at me, and I went, like, oh, God. Yeah, I am, yeah. And he said, what did it mean? What did it mean? What was it, what was it supposed to mean? It didn't mean anything. What did it mean about the pale horse? And quite angry, I said, well, it's about... Well, it's about guilt and it's mm. about paranoia and sin and shame and how you can never, ever, ever escape the things you've done. Yeah. Never. And he sort of looked at me for a long, long moment and then hefted his rake and went, maybe I'll watch it again. <laughs> and I, and I, okay, okay. But I think I, I, was, I was really keen to give it an ending which had bought into the kind of like the witchcraft thing. Oh, yeah. So because, you know, all of that, and, and interestingly, I mean, like it really, I mean, I suppose it's quite prescient when you think about people believing about 5G conspiracies and things like that, because here you've got a profoundly rational man who ends up believing that witches are real mm. and ends up believing that witches are trying to kill him and ends up believing that, only witches can save him from his certain death and that he wants to buy a curse and he believes that curse is going to make him immortal. A totally rational man with a television who believes in science, who believes in all of these things, ends up being stripped of all his certainties so he believes in the sort of the strangest, darkest 
superstitions and paranoias of who we are. He ends up believing it and only realises, you know, that where he goes, Christ, it was you all along. It was you all along, you know, the banality of evil. All along it was just a mean, horrible, cruel little man. And then just almost tying it up and going, well, you know what? What if it was real? What if there was a curse? What if what... So what if something had been said against him mm. and this, this thing that he dreamed all along, this was going to be his hell to relive over and over and over again the precise moment at which he ended his own life mm. because you commit a murder, you don't just end that person's life, you end your own life if you've got anything about you you end your own life, it will never leave you and so that's what I wanted to do. And there were, you know, the, the novel has a much more prosaic ending, which is everybody gets married and they have a happy time and the dogs get treated for ringworm and it's just, <laughs> so what? But at, I always find with Christy there's a tension between the book she wants to write and the book she knows people wants to read. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so there's always that sense of, well, here's your happy ending. And that happy ending thing only comes in. I'm going to go off on a bit of a rant now. Is that okay with oh, you? Oh, please do. OK, this happy ending thing really, really comes in with her after she um, she does a, a theatre adaption, a theatre production of And Then There Were None. And as we all know in And Then There Were None, the novel, it is extremely brutal, yeah. extremely remorseless. It's, um, it's like the ancient Greeks. You can't escape. You can't run away. Action bigots, action. You are heading towards your face, and it is a white-eyed, remorseless oblivion. It doesn't care how much you beg and plead and twist. You are not going to get away. You are going to fucking die, <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. So after the Second World War... Agatha Christie is in New York, where a version of And Then The Win On is going to be put on. And the theatre producers say to her, and I paraphrase all of this, you know, this is, I'm turning it into an anecdote, but the theatre producers say to her, look, everybody's been through a lot. We need a happy ending. Mm. She's going like, a happy ending. Yeah, I need a happy ending. And in this version, the happy ending that they want is that Philip Lombard and Vera Claythorne don't die. They mm. escape the island. They walk away into the sunset. A child killer and a serial killer <laughs> escape and walk away into the sunset hand in hand. It's turned into a rom-com. <laughs> and I always think about Agatha Christie, who is... Um, She's cute. She's cute when it comes to money. She needs to be. Yeah. He goes like, I'll take the money and I'll write you a happy ending. This is the happy ending that you want? This says so much about you, but you have that happy ending. And I think that she doesn't believe it. She doesn't believe it. But if that's what you want, and after that, you get this strange creation of happy endings where there shouldn't really be any. Yeah. And I don't, and I think it's that thing with her well I don't necessarily think that she believes people need happy endings she's gone through two world wars she's she's seen all of it she was a serving she was a serving fad for the entirety of the first world war she knows that there isn't happy ending she knows that there's obliteration and blasted flesh and broken minds but if this is what you want <laughs> this is what you can have <laughs> let's see if you question it yeah. and I always think she leaves these little clues to see if you're paying attention mm. to what she's really talking about and so what I do is I find I see what I think is a clue like a discordancy in the narrative something that is there that shouldn't really be there and I do a deep dive on that mm. and that is where I come up with my versions also oh so yeah and anyway weirdly I was um I was asleep on the floor one night because I'd had too much wine and I woke <laughs> up and there was a film on ITV4 or whatever and I was watching it for a bit sort of stunned I was like what the fuck is this Oliver Reed in a massive turtleneck jumper and um and an actress, like the Swedish actress, whose name escapes me at this particular moment in time, wearing almost nothing because, obviously, yes. you know, running around <laughs> this strange old house. And then suddenly Richard Attenborough turns up, seemingly covered in cobwebs and flaky skin. And I suddenly realised what I was watching was And Then There Were None. And I was watching the version where Lombard and Cl Vera Claythorne <laughs> escape, happy, 
so like strange. it's been turned into a kind of erotic thriller. Yeah. And it always makes me think that if she's going to change something, she'll change it, but she's doing it with an edge. She's doing it to see what the public reaction is to it. Like, can you forget what these people have done? That woman killed a child. Mm. That man is a serial killer and he doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> and the only thing that Vera really minds about what she did is not that she killed the child. It's that it didn't work <laughs> to get her what she wanted. You want a happy ending? Yes. Okay. Okay. And I always find there's a kind of real a real bitter dark sarcasm to her yeah. happy endings. Really, you've gone through all of this and this is what you want. You really want the tea on the lawn and all is well with the world. You have looked into the eyes of evil. Mm. You have conjured the devil, but now you're going to get married and have tea on the lawn. Okay, okay, if that's what you want. But I'm just going to put that little clue <laughs> over here to see if that roiling little worm of disquiet means anything to you at all. Well, it's one of the things I love about your adaptations because you sort of unpick that psychological wreckage that lingers for the characters. Yeah, definitely. And also the psychological wreckage that that is brought to them through the world that they live in. Like in, um, in Witness for the Prosecution, the, the wreckage, psychological, social, economic of the First World War on those characters... It, it, that that was the other character in the room, the aftermath, the long shadow, the dead, the mud, the howling, howling, inconsolable grief, the trauma. That was the long shadow cast across all of them. And what I really wanted to do was to have the the times in which they're in cast that shadow over all of those characters. The 1933 for for um, the ABC murders for Hercule Poirot. What the the rise of the British Union of fascism means for Hercule Poirot and um, to make him unfamiliar mm. as well like throughout in the script he doesn't get called unless people you know whenever his character name comes up it is always Hercule not Poirot Hercule so that he becomes slightly unfamiliar and somebody um, messaged me on Twitter and said you've ruined my childhood I mean <laughs> you're so pathetic you're such a snowflake making Poirot into a refugee it's just like what the fuck he is canonically he yeah. is a refugee and canonically he is called he is called uh papa papa poirot and canonically he is a devout catholic mm. and canonically he calls groups of adults mes enfants who does that a teacher a teacher calls groups of children mes enfants the only person who calls groups of adults mes enfants is a man who is being used to being called Papa, <laughs> mon père, father. I don't do. I don't pull this shit out of the air. <laughs> Finally, I have to mention Dublin Murders because, like, like most of the country, I was obsessed. It was fucking oh, thank you. amazing. In a time when I could leave my house, I chose not to, which I, I still have no thank regrets. Thank you very much. I still have no regrets. You're working on series two. Can you tell us anything? I've, I mean, I've, I've written two episodes. I'm really proud of them. I think we have to see what happens with the pandemic. Yeah. And I think there's going to be so many people in and so many productions and so many projects in exactly the same position, which is the world has changed and we have absolutely no idea what is going to happen. So um, we wait and see. We live in hope. Sarah, thank you so much for spending the time to thank chat to you. me today. That's a, it's been a real pleasure. Well, how good was that? Didn't I tell you? I honestly could have spoken to Sarah all day. Oh, it was such a fun conversation. Most of the time, I try and keep in absolutely everything the guest says. But on this occasion, she told me some great stuff about one of her up-and-coming projects, the second series of A Very English Scandal. 
but I've admitted it from this show as it would have spoiled some of the very big twists that story is going to take. But trust me, it is going to be massive and I cannot wait to see how she brings the story of the Duchess of Argyle to our screens. Oh, it sounds good. A huge thank you to Sarah for taking the time out for this podcast. This is still a brand new show, so please spread the word, but from at least two metres. If you like what you heard, give us a review and as many stars as you're able to give. This has been episode three of the Quarantine Break podcast. I'll be back soon, but in the meantime, please stay indoors. Stay indoors.